occasion with the joy and care of children. Give us courage, patience, and wisdom as we bring them up in the faith that they might never know a day apart from you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated for the reading from Holy Scripture. Children who are attending Children's Church may now depart to meet their teacher in the vestibule. This morning I'll be reading from Romans chapter 15, verses 14 through 21. I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. But in some points I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder, because of the grace given me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, in the priestly service of the gospel of God, so that the offering of, of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God, for I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience, by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Ericulum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. And thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. The word of the Lord. We'll also be reading from Isaiah chapter 66, verses 18 to 23. For I know their works and their thoughts, and the time is coming to gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and shall see my glory. And I will set a sign among them, and from them I will send survivors to the nations, to Tarshish, Pol, and Lud, who draw the bow to Tubul and Javan, to the coastland afar off, that have not heard my fame or seen my glory. And they shall declare my glory among the nations, and they shall bring all your brothers from all the nations as an offering to the Lord on horses and on chariots, and in litters and on mules and on dromedaries. To my holy mountain Jerusalem, says the Lord, just as the Israelites bring their grain offering in a clean vessel to the house of the Lord, and some of them also I will take for priests, and for Levites, says the Lord. For as the new heavens and the new earth that I make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your offspring and your name remain. From new moon to new moon and from Sabbath to Sabbath, all flesh shall come to worship before me, declares the Lord. The word of the Lord. Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated.
The bad news is I look goofy, though that may not be new to you. The good news is you can preach with one arm. So here we go. This morning we continue on in our sermon series uh, in Romans 15. And what Paul's doing here is he returns us to his original point when he opened the book of Romans in chapter 1 by reminding us that his ambition and his goal is to write to the church about their job as missionaries in the world, both then and carrying forward for today, using himself as an example of what a missionary life or a missional life looks like. So this morning, as we look at Romans 15, verses 14 through 21, we're going to look at three high points of Paul's life and ministry, and how he views himself as a missionary, and those three points are this. Paul's life, his missionary life, as a priestly ministry, as a powerful ministry, and as a pioneering ministry. Before we do that, let's pray for God's help in this work this morning. Heavenly Father God, we thank you for drawing us to yourself to worship and to witness. And God, as we look at the example of Paul's life as he lays it out in the book of Romans here in chapter 15, God, we pray that you might soften our hearts, dig out our ears, and open our eyes to see the call that you've placed on our lives, and the vocation that you've put us all in as kingdom agents and missionaries where you've placed us. And Heavenly Father, let these words be not mine, but yours. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. So starting in verses 14 through 16, we see here how Paul starts to lay out the idea that his ministry, as primarily a missionary, is also primarily a priestly ministry. In fact, in verse 16, Paul calls himself a minister of Christ to the Gentiles with the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God so that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God and sanctified by the Holy Spirit. It wasn't overly, it's not overly common in the New Testament to see apostles and disciples call themselves priests using the same language as we would get in the Old Testament for Jewish priests, but that's exactly what Paul does here. He's linking himself to the priesthood of the Old Testament, of the Israelite nation, of, of God's people. And he's not being gray or vague about it. He uses the actual the words that they would be familiar with, ostensibly calling himself a Levite, right? Or giving himself that kind of role within the church. What he's saying is that he is presenting an offering, which is the priest's duty, are you guys getting some feedback? Or are we good? Okay. Sorry. What he's saying is, at the priest, their job was to present offerings to God on behalf of the people, and from God to the people, the same way, bring blessings. And he's saying right here in Romans 15, listen, my role as a missionary is this. It's to present an offering to God in the form of Gentile believers being sanctified and made holy Right? So he's taking the same role as the priests in the Old Testament, saying now us as Christians, our job, our vocation is the same. To take unbelievers and walk with them to a place of belief and faith and obedience and present them to God holy and sanctified in the power of the Holy Spirit. It is to present to God newcomers, new believers as acceptable offerings. And Paul says that's, that's his ministry, but he also says that's your ministry. Church in Rome and church in Southampton here today. And for Paul, this is the chief task of the Christian life. He would link it two ways. He would say the Christian life is primarily about worship and about witness. It's a twofold life. And for Paul, these things are a cycle, a never-ending cycle. For you see, his, his job, our job is to go out and it's to witness to those who don't know why, so that they might come in and worship. And what happens when we worship? What happens to the prayer of thanksgiving that we sing every week? Send us out to love and serve you. Send us out to sing your praise. What is worship doing in our hearts, in our lives? What's the goal of worship? To glorify God and to send us out, right? And then what do we say at dismissal here at St. John's? 
Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. So you see how for Paul, this, this Christian life of worship and witness is totally tied together and cannot be broken apart. And he's telling this to the Roman church. He's saying, this is your job. Remember how in Romans 1, he went through the list of things where people were living rightly and then living outside of God's law? And throughout Romans, we've seen this positive and negative, the do's and the don'ts. This is how we live. This is how we aren't to live. Well, for Paul, the first and most important part of his ministry is the reality that he is called to be a priest. Right? And elsewhere in the New Testament, we read that we are all called to be a priesthood of all believers. And so right here, Paul's giving us, he's giving the church the meaning behind that message. That your job, that our job, is to draw others who don't know the King into His family and present them to God holy and blameless through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so for, for Paul, the Christian life is a priestly life. But he goes on in verses 18 and 19, and he says not only is it a priestly ministry, it's also a power-filled ministry. Paul continues on and in not so many words, says, I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading Gentiles to obey God. Right? And then what does he say there at the end of verse 18? By what and by what? By word and by deed, doesn't he? By what I have said and by what I have done. By the power of signs and miracles through the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is an incredibly important statement for us to marinate in. And it's why Paul writes it and gives himself as an example here. This is Paul's own understanding of the missionary life. And if we pay attention to this small two-verse section, we're going to see at least five features that Paul alludes to in this word power, using it repetitiously in what he's calling us to through his example. First, the objective of his missional life. What does it say it is right here? The objective of the missional life is, first of all, to lead unbelievers to obey God. It's interesting, isn't it? He doesn't just say believe, or come to understand, or know who he is. He goes from point A to point Z, and says, bring them to obedience. We often say here that the path of Christianity is to belong, to believe, and to behave. And Paul is staking his claim that as a successful Christian, vocationally, for any one of us, the goal is to take the people we meet from belong to behave. And it doesn't happen overnight. And Paul knows that. He understands that the way things work, it's, it's a journey. And so as Paul understands that, he also then goes on and he says, I refuse to stake a claim to my own exploits. It's not me. Right? He says, all I dare talk about is what Christ has accomplished through me. How easy is that in the world we live in? All I dare talk about is what Christ has accomplished through me. If you have social media, you've likely violated that. Right? If you've had a conversation with a coworker in the last two weeks, you've probably violated that. If you'd like to talk about your children, or your job, or your house, or your vacation, you've probably violated that. Absolutely. Which, they're not going to be fun to talk about anymore. Why is this so important to Paul? Because you see, for Paul, he doesn't claim to be a collaborator. It's not him and Christ. It's not him and the Spirit. It's not him doing anything but being utilized, being a tool, being an instrument for the kingdom by which Christ does not work simply with him, but more to the Gospel point, Christ works through him in the power of the Holy Spirit. And it is safer for us, friends, to think and work in this way as Christians because if it isn't with us, or by us, but through us, 
then the work is Christ's and not our own. Amen? It's His plan, not our plan. And also, at the end of the day, it's His glory and praise and not our glory and praise. And thirdly, Paul says that the missional work of his life is, and I quote, by what I have said and done, or as we said earlier, by word and deed, to put another way, the verbal and the visual. Right? It's a recognition for Paul and for us that as human beings we often learn better, more effectively through our eyes than through our ears. When you were growing up, and we're going to use a cultural example for a moment, how did you come to appreciate what was beautiful? Did you read it in a book? Or did you watch a Disney movie? When you were growing up, how, were you, how did you learn what was athletic? Was it by reading a book? Or sitting in class? Or going out to play basketball and getting smoked by the kid who was athletic? As it was for me. Through our eyes we learn much more effectively than through our ears. And so for Paul, the importance here is not just intellect, but action. The world around us will see who we are and come to know the Father by what we do and by what we say. Words explain works. But as John Stott said, works dramatize words. They make words come alive. Jesus' ministry is the best example of this, isn't it? If we go and look at Jesus' ministry, some of His most profound moments in ministry were actions, not words. Right when He invited an undersized tax man out of a tree to have dinner with Him. Zacchaeus. Right? Or when He took a child in His arms to proclaim that truly anyone who does not receive the kingdom of God like this little child will never inherit it. Now that could have been preached till he was blue in the face, and in some respects he did, didn't he? Said it over and over and over again to his disciples. But the most profound moment was when he picked up a child and he said this. This is what faith looks like. Or the example of the early church who was known for their common life together and their care for the needy. Right now let's take a moment to talk about the goodness and the challenge of the last seven days in our country. Right? I'm sure everyone in here is familiar with what happened in the Supreme Court this week with the overturning of Roe versus Wade, and we're not going down a conversation about that in particular or anybody's thoughts this morning, except to say this. Immediately upon the overturn, our bishop and our archbishop released a statement to their clergy saying this is both a great day and a challenge to us as churches. Because now there are 100,000 more children to be born in this country annually. Probably more than that. What are we going to do to protect, to serve, and to love young mothers, young children, orphans, those who need us? That's the call of the church. That's our job now, right? Is to step up to the plate and protect and serve and value human life. To be a people who bring human flourishing to the world around us. And so for Paul, the call to deed, not just word, is applicable to us very much so right now today, isn't it? What will we look like in how we love our neighbor? What will that mean? And fourthly, Paul's ministry, as he says, was by the power of signs and miracles. And now this statement brings together the threefold nature of supernatural events, doesn't it? Paul uses the word signs, which indicates the significance of an, of an event, right? Especially the arrival of God's kingdom. We see all throughout Scripture signs being the thing that tell us that God is coming or God is here. And then he, Paul also uses the word powers, which to some extent show the character of the events, particular in God's power over nature, in whatever case the sign might be. And lastly, this word wanders which indicates the effectiveness of the event, right? 
evoking people's amazement or awe at what just happened here. And we can look at Jesus' miracles or we can look at the ministry of Paul or the other disciples and we can see these moments where people, people's jaws hit the floor because of what God has done. And for Paul, in his day, these were the markers, these were the signs of an apostolic ministry signifying the work of Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit in the first apostles and the disciples following Christ. And that's not to say that those things don't still happen today. But we've come up with other markers, haven't we? Collars and robes and stoles and degrees and other markers. In fact, we have two men in our congregation, Trevor and Scott, in the process of discerning ordination right now. We have signs and we have markers. And for Paul, this was his stamp of approval. This is how I can tell you who I am, the authority by which I preach and heal and minister to God's people and those who don't yet know. It's because these signs and miracles and wonders are being done through me, not by me. That is his collar, so to speak. And fifthly, and perhaps most importantly, Paul says his ministry was through the power of of the Holy Spirit, Paul is incredibly diligent and intentional at separating all of his stuff from the work of the Holy Spirit. He ends this section on his ministry. He's using himself as an example. And he ends this section on his ministry by saying, it is all totally and completely and only by the power and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in me. It is not me, it's him. That's a big slice of humble pie for a man who spread the church across most of the known world. Right? For Paul, he completely removes himself from the driver's seat. He puts all the glory and praise and accolade on the Holy Spirit who works through him. For as we saw earlier, Paul understands that he's a tool or an instrument not the power. Now let me ask you a question. Have you ever seen a beautiful car? One that you've just, your dream car, right? Whether that's a Porsche or a Ferrari or a classic Chevelle or some other muscle car or a Tesla, whatever the case might be. Have you ever had that experience where you go and look at it and it's so beautiful And you want nothing else but to have that car and drive it home. And then you open, imagine opening the front end and there's no engine. What a beautiful piece of metal. And probably overpriced because of the name that's painted on the side. Right? There is no power to make this beautiful instrument useful on the road. In the same way, we are called, friends, to be winsome, to make the gospel beautiful and desirable to the people around us that God places in our lives, to those who don't know Him, but to understand that we're just the exterior. That the true power that makes the thing valuable, that makes the message work, is the engine in the car, the Holy Spirit in us. We're an instrument, and without the engine... We're nothing. We're tools. We're agents in the kingdom without the Holy Spirit. We are nothing. He is what makes us useful as instruments in the kingdom. And as there are a number of options as to what your favorite car is, like I said earlier, Tesla, Porsche, Ferrari, whatever the case might be, so too there are many types and styles of people in the church. Amen? If we were all the same, that would be boring anyway. But we can look around this room and we can find unity and diversity. All of us with a slightly different skill set or personality or look. And that is part of the who and how. Each one of us is called to be missional in our life. To be missionaries. It's part of how you are called to be winsome and to beautify the gospel in the places that God has equipped you to be. Which isn't the same for everyone. For the Amish who want nothing more than a beautiful horse and buggy, they can't be on the same track as a Ferrari. For us, the same is true. What you're gifted to do may not be what John and Sally down the street are gifted to do, and that's beautiful. 
Because there's somebody like you who needs your style of instrument to be drawn into the gospel. You're the one that God's equipped specifically for certain people in this world to beautify the gospel and draw them to their Savior. And finally, Paul says, not only is it a powerful ministry, not only is it a priestly ministry, but finally it's a pioneering ministry. In verses 19-22, through 22, he says, I've gone from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum. I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. Right? Paul is very short and sweet in this point. What is he saying? He's saying, my life has been given to bring the gospel where it has not been brought. I'm not going to where others have shared, where roots are planted from other teachers and preachers. My job, our job, friends, is to share the gospel and the love of Christ with those who have not heard to the ends of the earth. For over a decade, Paul strained and strove, surviving shipwrecks and beatings and many other things to bring the gospel to city centers that had not heard the good news and training up young leaders to take it outward from there. Right? Paul's making a statement for his audience that as far as they can go, as far as we can go, as far as the east is from the west, in the place where God has called you to be, in the gospel. Now Paul didn't anticipate who he was going to meet on the street or on his journey. He simply lived a life that showed exactly who Jesus is as often as he was able to through the power of the Holy Spirit. And he made a point of going to places and being present in places with people who hadn't heard or who deeply needed the truth and love and salvation offered through Jesus Christ in the words of Holy Scripture. We too are called to this life of pioneering for the gospel. And this is the point that Paul would want us to hear even though it's a little bit uncomfortable. Right? We have to get out of our zone. We have to get out of the places that we find comfort Paul would, he would tell us. He would beg of us to get uncomfortable for the kingdom. To not simply keep good Christian friends, but to use our lives to reach out to the lost, the lonely, the stranger, and walk with them in love and truth towards the cross. He would beg us to step into these cultural conversations that are never ending in truth and love rather than avoiding them for fear of judgment from the world around us or simply trying to drive people back to our opinion instead of driving the conversation to the heart of the gospel where Jesus will answer our questions. Amen? We are called, friends, to step up and step out. To care for the uncared for. To love the unlovable. And to bring Christ to the places in our little piece of the world here in the Delaware Valley where He isn't presently known. So as we close, we see in Paul's life a paradigm, an example for our own lives that in Christ we are called to be priests and that our vocation is to present new believers in obedience to God through witness and through worship. We are called into a ministry of power which is not us ourselves. Remember, we're the exterior. The Holy Spirit is the power. He's the engine that drives it. And thirdly, we're called to be pioneers, bringing the good news of Jesus Christ to the hedges and edges of society where we might be afraid or uncomfortable to go, not just sit in our comfortable circle, circles where we feel safe and sound. All for the purpose of continuing the growth and expansion of God's kingdom, that more people might hear, turn, and believe that Jesus Christ is King. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father God, You have called us as You called Paul to a missionary's life. And You've equipped us all as priests. You've filled us with the power of the Holy Spirit that He might work through us. And You've called us to go out to the hedges and the edges of society to bring Your love and truth and Gospel there. God, I pray for us this week this month, this season, the next 10 years of life here at St. John's and in our lives, even as we scatter. 
that you might use us as missionaries to build your kingdom. In your name we pray. Amen. It doesn't need to be said, but I wish to say it. Thank you very much, Pastor Josh, for that sermon. We affirm what you've said. Thank you for pointing, well, to our lives and the way ahead. Thank God for the scriptures that speak of these matters. Let's respond to the preached word of God. Let's stand and say together the Nicene Creed. Page 6 and 7. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead life of the world to come. Amen. And now kneeling or seated, let us pray for the church and for the world, saying, hear our prayer. For the peace of the whole world, and for the well-being and unity of the people of God. Thank you, Lord, that uh, the life of St. John's is not merely about this congregation. Thank you that uh, you've enabled us to be a living member of your worldwide church. Thank you for the church in the Ukraine, Russia, Central, Eastern, Western Europe, your church in Korea, China. I ask you to bless the well-being and unity of your people. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. for Foley, our Archbishop, for Steve, Alan, and Quig, our bishops, for all the clergy and people of our diocese and congregation. Thank you for Pastor Bill Kinney of this congregation. For Francisco Muniz, Muniz, Tim Miller, Bo Ovens, We thank you for the Anglican Christians scattered around this region. Give us grace to know how to come alongside them more and more. Lord, in your mercy, pray for unborn children, their mothers and fathers. give you thanks for the action of the Supreme Court this week. 
thank you for Bishop, for uh, Pastor Josh's reflection on this. Give us grace to be faithful, sacrificial, loving, wise. Bless this nation and the people of this nation, including the unborn. Calm those who are greatly distressed, angry, frustrated. Give us grace to love those who may not love. Lord, in your mercy, grant us courage and imagination to listen. Right now is a good time. To listen with humble hearts, speak the truth in love, to work toward justice and reconciliation, knowing that justice and reconciliation are found only and truly in our liberating Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Give us grace to be brave and courageous, faithful, honest, and true. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. for all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, for all who teach and disciple others, including the teachers, professors, homeschool parents, in this congregation. Thank you for Logan Hope School. Bless this institution. Thank you for John Jay Institute. Bless that institution. Cairn University, Eastern University, we cry out, Lord, have mercy. For Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary, as they prepare to move back into the city, have mercy. For each and all of us, as we are involved in ministry, with our neighbors, family, friends, those we perhaps barely know. Give us grace to know them. For Don Cobb and Elizabeth Shively as they write commentaries upon the scripture. Lord, in your mercy. For our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith. We're reminded, Lord, that for many centuries, June 29th has marked the martyrdom of the Apostle Paul. We thank you for those under great persecution even at this present time, and for those who will perhaps be martyred today and this week. Advance your gospel, O oh Lord. Give us grace to come alongside those who are suffering. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. for our nation, for those in authority, and for all in public service, ask you to bless and protect the, the Supreme Court justices and their families who have chosen to hand down this decision. Bless, humble, grant repentance to the leaders of our nation and to the followers Lord, in your mercy, I invite you to pray out loud by name for those for whom you're concerned in the silence and the petition that follows. For all those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity.
for the Palmer family as they move. Bless and protect them, lead and guide them. For the Siegenthaler family as they move, bless, guide, direct them. Keep them safe as they travel to Idaho. For those in military service, for Jared and Key Schmidt, for Corbin Bird, for John Klein and those under his command. Lord, in your mercy, that we may end our lives in faith and hope, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy, We continue with the Confession and Assurance of Forgiveness, page 7. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done, by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry. And we humbly repent for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation of our sins, not ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. That's why we may say with assurance, the peace of the Lord be always with you. And with your spirit. We were another in Christ. Please. Well, again, good morning, all. 
There it is, 213 pages of a historic document. You've all read it by now, I'm sure, <laughs> including the dissenting comments. Good reading, if you need something to go to sleep to. You're going to have to learn some words. Yes, ma'am. What's that? What is this? This is called the Supreme Court of the United States, Dobbs State Health Officer of Mississippi Department of uh, Health at all versus Jackson Women's Health Organization at all. This is the most recent uh, Supreme Court decision. Now, I don't know if everybody stands in the same place. It, by now, you would have figured out that St. John's is a, is a life-affirming, Thank you, Denise. Life-affirming congregation. In other words, uh, we care about matters beyond abortion. We care about matters that have to do with, well, my brother used the word human flourishing. Uh, from cradle to grave, from uh, womb to tomb, uh, there are different terms out there. But one thing that you should be clear about is this does not end the debate. This is not the end of the topic. It pushes the topic back into the states probably where it should have been in the first place. It doesn't end the topic concerning the philosophical, the moral, the social, the theological uh, issues that have to do with uh, abortion and all that that means about the issue of family, uh, uh, about what life means, interpretation of the Constitution. Uh, there's a great deal that's still going on. Let me urge you, just one area, just one area to think about. Be praying for crisis pregnancy centers. Uh, they are openly being attacked, and I mean in destructive ways. I don't just mean in the press. Be praying for uh, North Care, uh, which we contribute to and with which we have a relationship. Be praying for those others that are around you as this topic continues to, well, bubble, boil, burn, whatever the case may be. So, but there you are. You can find it on the internet if you want. I'm gonna read it. Uh, you have to learn terms like soteric, sur, sur, yeah, you have to learn a term like that. <laughs> Stare decisis, get, get a good dictionary. Soteriori, I can't even say it right. Never, I'm no lawyer. But you might have to learn a few terms, but I think it would be worthwhile reading. This is indeed an historic document. A few other announcements. I'm honored that my father, his wife are here, Dad, Edith, glad that you're joining us today. Um, if, you have, if there are other guests, I won't call, I don't mind calling out my dad, that's all right. I'll hear about it later, but nevertheless, I'm glad he's here. You can greet him. If you wonder where I got all my flaws from, <laughs> it wasn't my dad. Um, but I'm really pleased that you're here visiting us uh, as a guest today. If you have any questions about our worship service or anything that you may have seen that puzzles you as a guest, please feel free to come and ask one of us who are dressed funny, and we'll be glad to answer your questions as best we know how. A few other items ending well on July the 10th. After the 10 a.m. worship service, we'll have a lawyer, an attorney here, who will be talking to us, uh, those of us who are interested about matters that have to do with end of life, such things as DNRs and wills and so on and so forth. Statements for the first half of the year for your giving will be emailed in July, will be made available to you via email. Uh, if you don't have an email address in our records, please feel free to let us know, which brings us to another topic. We've been trimming back some of unused email addresses. If you use info at tonowchrist.org, don't use that anymore. Use admin, admin at tonowchrist.org. Your email will be bounced back. Know that there's nothing wrong with our email. We, we just have been trimming costs, um, which are related to the number of email addresses we use. Anything else? Any other announcements? Anything that I may have omitted? Well, let's continue in our worship then with the giving of ourselves in our tithes and offerings. Let us come into the courts of the Lord with thanksgiving.
Our brother Josh in his sermon talked about word and deed and the reformers in the worship, uh, worship services which they developed, compiled, put together word and sacrament again. Word which explains the deed and deed which dramatizes, I like that phrase, dramatizes the word. This is the table that the Lord Jesus set himself, as it were, for his disciples. And he fed them with himself, symbolically, of course. And this is an opportunity for you. If you're a guest here today, and you're a baptized Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ, you're welcome to this table. As we participate in bread and wine, we are participating in the Lord's table, by which he pours out his grace on us, indeed, not just in word. We're continuing with page eight in your bulletins. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right. It's our duty and our joy always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth through Jesus Christ our Lord, for he is your living word from before time and for all ages. By him you created all things, and by him you make all things new. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Let us pray. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had sinned against you and become subject to evil and death, you and your mercy sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, into the world for our salvation. By the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, he became flesh and dwelt among us. In obedience to your will, he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once for all, that by his suffering and death, we might be saved. By his resurrection, he broke the bonds of death, trampling hell and Satan under his feet. As our great high priest, he ascended to your right hand in glory, that we might come with confidence before the throne of grace. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it. and He gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, and we offer you these gifts 
Sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. And sanctify us also that we may worthily receive these holy sacraments and be made one body with him so that he may dwell in us and we in him. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ and bring us with all your saints into the fullness of your heavenly kingdom where we shall see our Lord face to face. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And continuing, we do not presume to come to this your table, O merciful Lord, trusting on our own righteousness, but in your abundant and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose character is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. These are the gifts of God, and they are for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and that he rose again. And feed on him in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving. In a moment, the ushers will direct you. For those of you who are gifts, we use uh, a pattern with, with wafers and a common cup. If you're uncomfortable with that, we have little kits that you can use that have a little bit of wine and a wafer in it, and that way you don't need to take from the common cup if you're uncomfortable. Simply ask for one. We also have gluten-free wafers for those who may have difficulties with gluten.
Let's stand together and sing the prayer of thanksgiving, page 11. My brothers and sisters, all our problems we send, send to the cross of Christ. Christ. And all our difficulties we send to the cross of Christ. And all the devil's works we send to the cross of Christ. But all our hopes we, we set on the risen Christ. And Christ, the Son of Righteousness, shine upon you and scatter the darkness from before your path. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. Amen. Rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit.